I did go through a period of time when I was struggling where I really tried to perfect my bedtime routine. And so I came home and I had no screens and I didn't eat anything because you're not supposed to eat before bed. As I explained in the book, that's not true for everybody. Um, I, you know, I had the lavender oil on the pillow and I would take the baths and I would do this and I would do that. And I, I was doing all of the quote unquote right things and having a terrible time sleeping. Looking for a better sleep? Try Magnesium Breakthrough from Bioptimizers and get seven forms of magnesium in each capsule. Click the link in the description or pinned comment to save 10%. Diane, welcome to the show. How you doing? Jesse, thanks so much for having me. I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing really well as well. And I really enjoyed your book, The Sleep Fix. We're going to get into everything sleep. And you come from this from an interesting perspective as somebody, you know, who has had sleep challenges over the years. Now you've went through and, and figured out what's worked for you, talked to a lot of the experts, and you're bringing all this knowledge to us. So let's start off by talking about your sleep story, going back to the beginning when when you started to suffer with uh, mouth sleep. So yeah, I struggled for years to uh, both fall asleep and stay asleep. And I, I, for a really long time, I just sort of dismissed it as that's just how I am. That's just how I built. And I thought this was just something I had to live with. Uh, and eventually it got so bad, I really couldn't ignore it anymore. Um, and in my case, this was tied to my very strange work hours because working in news, you know, you, sometimes you work super early morning, sometimes it's a true overnight shift, et cetera. Um, but eventually my sleep problems got so bad, I couldn't ignore them anymore. And so I then started reading a lot about sleep and trying every sleep tip I could find and all of those sort of listicles and articles and TV segments. And not only... Did it not make me better? I think it actually made me worse. And eventually things got so bad that I went to my doctor and I told her what was going on. And she convinced me to start taking Ambien. And I was very, very hesitant about taking a sleeping pill. Um, but she she talked me into it and said, you know, essentially just take it at least after a string of, of bad nights. It's kind of a reset. And so I started doing that while, again, still continuing to read a lot about sleep and the more I read about it, the more I just saw everything about how important sleep was, how important it was to get the quote unquote recommended eight hours and how doomed I was if I wasn't doing that, which just made me more worried, which made it harder for me to sleep. So then I actually started taking the Ambien a little bit more often because I was worried more and more about not getting enough sleep. And the Ambien for a while was like a magic little pill. I would take half of this tiny pill and within a half an hour, I was out. No matter what was going on, my husband had a Super Bowl party in the next room and I was out at, you know, 7 p.m. Uh, but eventually even the Ambien stopped working. And that for me was my big light bulb moment because I called my doctor and her advice to me was to just take more Ambien. And this is a very common experience for people with insomnia, but I kind of decided right then and there, this was not the way forward for me. And I needed to find a real solution to this problem. And so I kind of turned into a sleep nerd from there. I got screened for sleep apnea. And once I ruled that out, I started reading sleep textbooks and books about sleep, but not the ones on the bestseller list, the ones that were written by clinicians who actually treat patients with sleep problems. Uh, and they're not always the most dynamic and interesting reads, you know, because they're written for people who are also professionals. And so it's, it's, it feels a bit academic. Um, but ultimately, that's where I found my answers. And within about three weeks of trying some of that stuff, I was getting a quote unquote full night's sleep in the middle of the day because I was working overnights. And that was something everyone told me, including some sleep experts told me I would never be able to do. And that if I wanted to sleep well again, I was going to have to quit my job. Um, and so, yeah, I was just surprised by one, how quickly uh, it worked two how practical some of these things were, because so much of the sleep advice I had gotten made it sound like I was going to have to upend my life, you know, including quitting my job if I wanted to sleep well. And none of this involved any of that. Uh, and then finally, how different and in some case opposite it was to a lot of the typical sleep advice that's out there. And so I just kind of thought, well, why isn't anybody talking about this stuff? And, uh, you know, fast forward two years, I read a ton of books just to sort of increase my knowledge, but also make sure that what I wanted to write wasn't already out there. And I started talking to a ton of sleep experts. And 
I realized that it wasn't out there. And, um, and so I ended up writing the book that I wish had existed when I was struggling. And my hope is that the sleep fix will save a lot of other people from going through what I went through or save a lot of people who are going through it right now and, and may not have a light at the end of the tunnel. I hope this book can help them finally get out of it. Well, I'm sure it's gonna. And let's go back to the beginning of your story. You talked about trying a number of different things that you read online and things ended up getting worse. Let's put a timeline on that. How far back does that go? Is this like 10, 15 years or how far back? Uh, it was. I think it all lasted about seven years for me. Um, but the interesting part was I have always been someone who didn't require a lot of sleep. And so my mother will tell you, and I, I talk about this in the book, my mother will tell you that as a baby, I never really napped. Um, I didn't get a ton of sleep at night, not nearly as much as uh, I should have for my age, you know, by the book. Um, in in kindergarten, when everybody else was having nap time, I was the kid awake in class, wondering when I would finally be able to get up off this mat. Um, same with when, you know, we had nap time at home. My older sister, who's four years older than I am, she would fall asleep and I was always wide awake. Um, but that narrative to me changed when I did start struggling because I then started saying, oh, well, I've had sleep problems my whole life. And it was only when I finally got better and learned a little bit more about the intricacies of some of these sleep issues that I realized that wasn't true. It was a narrative that I had sort of developed and started believing. And we often will become, we lose so much confidence in our ability to sleep that that lack of confidence actually exacerbates our sleep problems in and of itself. So it was kind of an important part of my story that I had changed the narrative in that direction. Because now in retrospect, no, I didn't have sleep issues until my work schedule changed when I started working in broadcast news and I, a biological night owl, was then forced to wake up at three o'clock in the morning, 1.30 in the morning, go in at 10 p.m. and work until nine o'clock in the morning. And I did not have the tools to know how to adjust and get my body, which is primed for sleep kind of late at night and early in the morning, to sleep on those hours instead. Um, and, and I think that is something that a lot of us fall into, uh, not only kind of dismissing things as, oh, well, this is just how I am. This is just how I'm built. But then also suddenly thinking this is an inevitable thing. You know, I'm inherently broken. I always have been. I always will be. And and none of those things are true. Most of the time, if you're not sleeping well, there's a very, you know, sort of straightforward explanation for what's happening and a treatment to fix it. That's great news. And how often do you find through your research, there are people that have a genetic predisposition to suffering from different sleep issues? Well, so we do. And that's that's interesting because I am someone who has predisposing factors, as they're called, to insomnia. Uh, one of them being that my mother struggles with sleep too, and, and a lot of um, sleep issues are genetic. Uh, my mother, we also learned through her reading uh, the first draft of my book, also has restless leg syndrome. Um, but she wasn't aware of that because like so many sleep patients, she went to her doctor complaining about a, you know certain sensations in her legs, and the doctor scanned her for blood clots I mean, over the course of years, she went through more than one scan to make sure there were no blood clots in her legs. And when they didn't find blood clots, they sent her home with a diagnosis of your legs are fine. Now, had that clinician known anything about sort of sleep and red flags and the red flags of restless leg syndrome, she would have, one, asked my mother about her sleep and learned that my mother has had lifelong sleep issues, and B, would have realized the red flags of what my mother was complaining about in her legs is sort of night clear as day restless leg syndrome symptoms. And she would have then referred my mother to a neurologist instead of scanning her legs for blood clots. But there's such little knowledge among not only the general population, right? We as patients who recognize problems in ourselves and don't know enough about sleep to recognize them as sleep problems, which I for so long did not. But also the primary care physicians who we go to for help when we do notice there is a problem of some kind. You know, the the latest survey shows the average medical school, four-year medical school, the average four-year medical school spends two hours on sleep. And in talking to doctors who've been there, they tell me that most of that time, and in some cases it's even less, obviously, but most of that time is spent talking about sleep apnea, 
which is only one sleep disorder, which is very sort of physical and mechanical in nature, completely different than something like insomnia or restless leg syndrome or narcolepsy or lots of the other reasons that many of us are kept awake at night. And so we go to our doctors and complain about certain things and we end up being undiagnosed or misdiagnosed and end up treating the wrong problem and getting no results or getting no treatment at all because we just then assume, well, I guess I must just be broken. Well, given what you've been through in your journey to getting a diagnosis and and treating yourself and now sleeping a lot better, let's talk about somebody right now who is you know, experiencing symptoms of tiredness during the day, feeling like they're waking up at night. I mean, there's so many different symptoms. Let's just keep it really general for now and say somebody that is struggling with their sleep, what would you recommend to them to start off to get that proper diagnosis? Um, If I can backtrack for a second and add to my previous um, answer, which I just realized I, I missed one central point, and that is that while many of us are predisposed to insomnia, or, or other sleep disorders, it doesn't mean they are inevitable. And it doesn't mean that we then can't sleep well because we have these predisposing factors. And I am a perfect example of that. You know, I take so many boxes of predisposing factors for insomnia and some other issues, including restless leg syndrome. And yet I now sleep great at night against all of the odds. So I want people to know that too, that yes, you may be fighting a, a a bigger battle than somebody else does, but it doesn't mean that you're not going to be able to sleep well, even in an imperfect environment. Um, in terms of what people can do to sort of set up, set off on that path, I think key number one that we often miss um, and we're misled into believing that there's sort of one set of sleep tips. If you do these 10 things, you will fall asleep in five minutes, right? You see that everywhere. And one, we're not supposed to fall asleep in five minutes. That's probably an indication that you're sleep deprived and something's wrong. Um, And two, there is no one set of top 10 sleep tips because what is going to help you sleep is going to be dependent, one, on what it is that's keeping you awake. And there may be a lot of different possibilities there, which require a lot of different solutions. And two, it's also going to depend on you, your lifestyle, your needs, the kind of solutions that you can actually fit into your life. Uh, And so I think step one, and I started the sleep fix chapter one is about identifying the problem because I really think any sleep correction journey needs to start there. And so I I love for people to just get kind of a basic knowledge of some of the more common sleep disorders out there um, because they are common. And I think a lot of us think of things like restless leg syndrome or sleep apnea or even narcolepsy as, oh, well, I couldn't possibly have that. And you'd be surprised how common these disorders are and how many people are walking around with them right now and they have no idea that they have them. Uh, And I list in the book a few different tips on how you can go about um, discerning this. Um, But two sort of really quick ones. One is keeping a sleep diary, which if you do go see a sleep specialist, that will often be one of the first things they'll tell you to start doing. And that's pretty straightforward. You just log things like what time you went to bed, what time you think you actually fell asleep, what if you woke up throughout the course of the night, how many times and how long, uh, what time you woke up uh, for the last time, uh, what time you actually got out of bed. Um, And you can log extra things like whether you consumed caffeine that day and how much, if you worked out that day, how much, uh, if you had a late night meal, anything you think might be impacting your sleep. And it, it has an interesting impact. One, because just writing things down will sometimes help you to improve your sleep habits. Uh, and for the short time that I kept a food diary, I found this also helped me in that sense. But there's something about the act of writing something down that you don't want to have to write down that you were up watching The Walking Dead until 2 o'clock in the morning or playing Candy Crush until 1 a.m. So often you'll stop doing it because, you know, you want to be honest with yourself and write it down and you don't want to have to face it when you actually write it down in that little notebook. So sometimes and I'll we, add to that too. Probably a lot of times we're doing these things without even really stopping and thinking about what we're doing. You know, we might have a habit of playing Candy Crush before bed and not even realize, you know, you do realize, but you're not maybe realizing how long or how often you're doing it. When you start writing that down, it's going to really put it in front of your face and, and make you look at it. Well, that's a perfect segue to what the second sort of benefit is and the primary benefit is. Not only does it intrinsically sort of sometimes help your sleep habits um, just by the exercise itself, but when you keep a, sla- a sleep diary for a week or two weeks, you start to notice patterns and certain things will often start to jump out at you and things you didn't even realize 
were contributing or potentially contributing to your sleep issues suddenly start to jump off the page. And and that's a perfect example. You know, maybe uh, playing Candy Crush, and I, I don't want to indict Candy Crush here, but, um, you know, whatever it is, certain habits that may be contributing may start to pop out at you where you say, oh, this might be a problem. Maybe I should cut that out. Um, or you may notice that you um, wake up prematurely you know, every morning. And so that's sort of a different kind of insomnia than if you have trouble falling asleep at night. Or you might realize, and, and this will be the case, I think, for a lot of people, you might realize, for example, that in your head, it feels like I'm constantly waking up throughout the middle, you know, throughout the night, and I never get a good night's sleep. And when you start keeping your sleep log, you might realize that you get a decent night's sleep, you know, three, four times a week. And you actually are only waking up once throughout the course of the night, and it's not taking you that long to fall back asleep. We sometimes will sort of exaggerate in our heads what our problem is because it feels that way. And when you actually start keeping track of it on the page, you may realize um, that your problem is a little different than you thought it was. And so the sleep log can not only uh, help you in those ways, but if you do get to the end of two weeks and you still kind of have no clue what it is that's causing your sleep issues or you've, you know, addressed whatever does jump out at you on the page and you feel like that's still not happening. Now you still have this body of evidence to go to your primary care physician or to go to a sleep specialist with, and you're already ahead of the game because they're going to ask you all sorts of questions. And most of those questions under normal circumstances would then take a few weeks to answer because they're going to tell you to go home and log it. And you've already done that. So now you're ahead of the game when it comes to not only helping your own problem, but also if you do require professional help with helping them to diagnose you and to start treating you more quickly. And then the other part, you know, is if you have a baby monitor at home or, a, you know, a home security camera, we have a little wise cams in my house. Put one of those somewhere in your room where you can film yourself while you're sleeping and either record audio of yourself using your phone while you sleep. There are apps that will help you do that. Or if you can record video and audio of your sleeping. And that can also be quite revealing because you can start to notice things like, you know, do you talk or kick or jerk or snore in your sleep? You know, not all of us a have bed partners and not all of us have bed partners who are going to notice things like that about our sleep. So using a recording can really be helpful to notice things about your own sleep that you are incapable of noticing and that maybe a bed partner is either non-existent or a bed partner is fast asleep themselves. So they're not going to notice it about you. And that can reveal a lot in terms of trying to pinpoint what it is that's keeping you awake. And that can then help you find the right sleep solutions to actually solve your problem so that they'll be effective. And when people take this on themselves, say they start journaling or doing a recording, either audio or video, how often do you find that a lot of times they can get to the root of what's happening and correct it themselves without having to see a professional. I mean, I can't say that I don't have, I don't think there is data to show those numbers. And the, obviously I spoke to tons and tons of clinicians in writing this book, but they only see the patients who end up coming to them with, with the problems. And so, you know, we're often not going to hear from the people who do find these helpful as self-help tools, but I do just know anecdotally from talking to lots of people who did find that this was helpful. And some of them even found it helpful even while they were seeking professional help because they did find, for example, that it was easier to sort of keep track of themselves. It was easier to be accountable even when they knew the answers to actually do um, those things and stay on track. And it gave them an extra boost because they were then able to tra see their progress. And sometimes in the beginning, you won't notice that part, and it, it can be easy to sort of lose motivation. And again, I already talked about the importance of sleep confidence in your ability to sleep. And so when you start seeing the momentum shift in the other direction, that can help boost your sleep confidence, which in and of itself can help improve your sleep. You mentioned in the book that there's, you know, typically when people think about going to see a specialist, they probably picture going to like a sleep lab and sleeping in this strange bed overnight with all kinds of electrodes and, and getting right into it. But you talked about in the book that there's actually, you can get something mailed to the house to do this from home now. Can you talk about what that, what that looks like? Sure. So I actually shot a video of it not too long ago, but we, um, which you're reminding me, I should post. Um, this is specific to sleep apnea, um, which is an incredibly, incredibly common. And this is a breathing issue that causes you to stop breathing while you're sleeping at night, sometimes up to 100 times an hour, and so in some cases, even more than that. 
Um, so imagine someone smothering you with a pillow 100 times an hour throughout the course of a night. You would probably consider that a top priority problem that you had to fix. But with sleep apnea, A, you don't know what's happening. So you wake up in the morning thinking you got a full night's sleep when you didn't. Or you wake up thinking you have insomnia because you woke up throughout the course of the night, but you don't realize that it's the breathing issue that's waking you up. But sleep apnea can be incredibly dangerous, not only because of the sleep deprivation effects that it has, um, but also it has lots of other side effects, including it can give you high blood pressure, heart issues, et cetera. It can even cause death. So sleep apnea in and of itself is incredibly dangerous and incredibly common. And so there is... There are several ways to test at home for sleep apnea, meaning under professional care, but they will send you a test to do at home. And one of them is this tiny little chip. It's probably less than an inch long. It's kind of oval shaped. So imagine maybe something like a smaller version of your thumbprint, maybe like your your pointer finger um, print, your fingerprint. And it's that size. And when they send it to you, you just put it on your finger while you sleep. It's so incredibly non-intrusive. And the data will then automatically go to the doctor who is overseeing your care, a sleep specialist. And based on the data from that test, they can then tell you whether or not you have sleep apnea. So you don't have to go and be hooked up like Frankenstein. You don't have to spend the night in a lab. And I think what a lot of people don't realize is you may not also need a CPAP machine because while that is the gold standard treatment for insomnia, something like 50% of sleep apnea patients end up not using it after a very short period of time. And I think there are a lot of people out there who don't even want to get diagnosed, even if they suspect they do have sleep apnea, because they don't want to spend the night in the lab, but they also don't want to be told they need a CPAP because they don't want to sleep with that machine on their face. And while sleep uh, CPAPs are incredibly helpful, I do think it's important for people to realize that there are alternative options for treatment to sleep apnea. So if that's the reason why you're avoiding going to the sleep doctor, please don't. Please go and get checked because it can literally save your life. And the solution may be something as simple as wearing a mouth guard while you sleep. For somebody who's suffering, I know this wasn't the challenge you had, but for somebody who is suffering from sleep apnea, what would that feel like waking up in the morning after waking up so many times throughout the night? Well, so I don't personally have sleep apnea. My father does though. And I know a lot of people who do. Um, What they specifically feel like is hard to pinpoint because for them that has felt normal. And so they often don't describe the symptoms that they feel other than feeling sleepy. They will often report feeling um, sleepy during times of stillness, even during the day. So a few red flags for for sleep apnea, including snoring, but that's not a requirement. A lot of people have sleep apnea and they don't snore, which I think is a misconception. Um, But also, if you're the kind of person who, for example, will have a tendency to doze off if you sit down in a waiting room, or if you sit down to watch TV or read a book in the middle of the day at a time that you would normally expect to be awake, if you have a tendency to doze off during those kinds of moments of stillness, even during the daytime when you wouldn't expect to be sleeping, that is a red flag that something is wrong. And so if you know you're just not getting enough sleep because you don't spend enough time in bed, well, that's probably your answer. But if you are theoretically getting enough sleep and you think, well, I don't know why I would be sleep deprived, then chances are something is disturbing your sleep while you are sleeping without you knowing it, what I call a secret sleep disorder. Sleep apnea could be one, uh, restless leg syndrome or PLMD could be another, you, you could have night, narcolepsy, hypersomnia. There's a long list of possibilities. But point being is that that's a sign that there's a problem and it's time to get it checked out because addressing that problem can be a huge game changer. And, and you asked me how it feels to have something like sleep apnea. I think it's more easy to talk about what it feels like after you address it because one analogy that I thought was great is one of the people I interviewed for the book said he felt like he'd been shot out of a cannon. The first morning that he woke up after sleeping with a CPAP machine, that's how much energy he had. He said he felt like he had the energy of a, you know, a child or a teenager for the first time in his entire adult life. And when I interviewed my father about this, he said it felt like that feeling when you have a headache and then you take medication and the headache suddenly goes away. You may not have noticed that whole time how bad that headache was affecting you. But once you take the medication, the headache is suddenly gone. You think, oh, gosh, I feel so much better. And so I think it's more that even people who feel like, oh, I'm functioning kind of fine. You 
you may still have a problem and you may be so surprised when you finally address that problem, how much better you feel. And then you, you're stuck with the with the feeling of, gosh, this is how I could have felt this whole time, um, which also applied to me, even though I didn't have sleep apnea. When I finally addressed my insomnia, it was only then that I realized how sleep deprived I had been all those years and how bad I felt all those years. Because not only did I have more energy, but all my other symptoms, my acid reflux, my dry eyes, and all these other things that I'd never connected to my sleep suddenly went away. Well, Diane, since there's so many different, you know, sleep conditions people can suffer from and and there's going to be different ways of going about alleviating and getting to the root of those problems. We talked about, you know, journaling and recording and seeing a sleep specialist, or even if it's if it's possibly sleep apnea, getting, you know, that chip mail to the house and so we gave a pretty good baseline there, but I think a good step from here would be to talk about your personal journey with insomnia. So we can talk about when you finally got the help you needed and started to make changes, what were those changes? And then how quickly did you start feeling better? Well, so I, um, I had two problems. I had a circadian rhythm disorder, um, which I kind of briefly explained, but a circadian rhythm disorder just means that you are going to sleep at a time your biological clock wants you to be awake and you are trying to wake up at a time your biological clock thinks you're supposed to be sleeping. And so people will be very familiar with this if they've traveled around to through multiple time zones and experienced jet lag. Jet lag is a circadian rhythm disorder, right? You travel to Europe and suddenly your body's still on New York time or LA time. And so you just feel completely off. You feel awake when you're supposed to be sleeping. You feel exhausted when you're trying to be awake and everything just feels really discombobulated. That's circadian rhythm disorder. And if you are a shift worker, for example, shift work disorder is another circadian rhythm disorder, but it's the same idea. What I think a lot of us don't realize is that you don't have to work a traditional overnight shift and be a traditional quote unquote shift worker in order to experience this. If you're a biological night owl, for example, and you work normal hours, chances are in order to make it to that normal work schedule, you're waking up long before your body is actually primed to be waking up. And so long before your body is sending you wake signals. And on the contrary, you're waking up when your body is still sending you sleep signals. And then when you try to go to sleep at night, you're not that sleepy and it's hard for you to fall asleep. Not because you're lazy or you're an idiot or you, you know, have really bad sleep habits that might be contributing, but that's not always the case. It may just be because your body is not primed for sleep yet. Um, and so that was one of my problems. The other problem is that, and this is something that completely blew my mind and I totally underestimated. And I think a lot of people underestimate when they talk about the issue, sleep problems in general. I had no idea how much my mind and my worries about sleep were keeping me awake. And that in a nutshell is what chronic insomnia is. You spend, there's some sort of triggering event that causes you to stay awake. Let's say you're excited about something, you're nervous about something, maybe you're grieving a death, maybe you are worried about something that's happening at work, whatever it is, anything can sort of trigger a bad night of insomnia. But we will then often perpetuate it by doing two things. One, we will try to nap or sleep in or go to bed early to try to make up for that sleep loss, especially if like me, you're reading a lot about sleep and reading all about how doomed you are if you don't get enough of it. Um, and all that does is now that depletes your sleep drive. And our sleep drive is what we need in order to fall asleep at night. It's like hunger. The longer you are, you go without eating, the more hungry you feel. The more you eat, the less hungry you feel. Sleep drive works the same way. The longer you're awake, the higher and more powerful your sleep drive is. The longer you sleep, your sleep drive dissipates. So after a full night's sleep, your sleep drive is nice and low or non-existent, and you start the cycle all over again. So if you are napping or going to bed um, early or sleeping in, all that means is now when bedtime rolls around, you're not that sleepy. Your sleep drive is not that high. And so that makes it harder to fall asleep. The other part of the equation is things like worry, excitement, stress, anxiety. All of those things power up our wake drive. And I think we often think about sleep like a light switch. You know, you just switch it on and now I'm in sleep mode. But it's more like I call it a sleep seesaw. When we fall asleep at night, it's not because we flipped some switch. It's because our sleep drive overpowered our wake drive. But if you're really worried about something, anxious about something, thinking a lot about something in sort of that mentally active state, 
your wake drive is powered up more than usual or more than it should be. And that makes it harder for your sleep drive to compete. And now your sleep seesaw tips back into awake territory. And so you can see how this becomes a cycle because something happens and you don't sleep well for a few days, let's say, up to two weeks. But now in order to make up for that, we try to nap or sleep in or go to bed early. Now we're trying to go to bed when we're not that sleepy, which makes it even harder for us to fall asleep because we're also still in this mentally aroused state. So now our wake drive is high and our sleep drive is low. We're, we're fighting an uphill battle here. And then the last part of the ingredient is as we do this over time, our mind starts to form an association. When we spend enough time in bed, awake and worrying, our brain has this kind of mental autopilot feature that recognizes patterns in our behavior and prepares for what's coming next. So if you were to walk into your favorite restaurant, for example, that you go to regularly, you might start salivating before you even look at the food because your brain walks in and says, oh, I know this place. This is where we eat. And it starts that process automatically. So that doesn't require any active thought on your part. The same thing happens with sleep. This is why we always hear about the benefits of a bedtime routine, that you will eventually start recognizing all of these things as a cue for sleep. However, if your bedtime routine ends in you being awake and worried in bed, it has the opposite effect, where now as bedtime comes near and as you get into bed, instead of being a cue for sleep, it's a cue to be awake and to start worrying. And this is where people will often experience the, that sensation of you're kind of dozing off on the couch. You're so sleepy that now your eyelids are all heavy and you go right to bed. And suddenly, as soon as your head hits the pillow, you're wide awake thinking about the conversation you had yesterday or what you're going to be for Halloween in five months. Something really, you know, sometimes it's something really pointless, right? And that is kind of the calling card of chronic insomnia. It means you've developed this conditioned arousal, which means that sort of mental autopilot feature that bed is where we stay awake and worry. And now bed has become a cue for that. And if you have that issue, which so many of us do, you have to address that if you are to fix your sleep problems. It doesn't mean it's the only issue. There may be other things that are keeping you awake. Like in my case, my circadian rhythm disorder, I had to address that too. But what I learned throughout my own journey was if I had only focused on the circadian rhythm part of the equation, I probably would continue to have sleep problems because it was only one of the problems. I also had to address my insomnia and this conditioned arousal. And I think the mistake a lot of people make is something else might lead them to their insomnia, a circadian rhythm disorder, restless leg syndrome, any sleep apnea, any of these other um, sleep disorders can coexist with insomnia. And often we, and even clinicians sometimes will make the mistake of only addressing the primary cause. And they think the insomnia will then just go away on its own. And often that's not the case, but it can work in reverse. If you have, let's say, a, a pain issue that caused you to have insomnia, or if you, let's say, you struggle with depression, for example, that can sometimes go hand in hand in insomnia, clinicians will sometimes find that um, even if you treat the depression, you treat the pain issue, treat whatnot, the insomnia c continues because you haven't treated that part of the equation. But if you treat the insomnia from the get-go, not only does that help alleviate the insomnia, but it can also help to make the treatment of the other condition go go more smoothly. And so I, I, I talk about insomnia a lot because I think it's the most counterintuitive of all the sleep disorders in addition to being the most common. And it's the one that people most frequently assume is not actually a sleep disorder and doesn't require treatment and is something they just have to live with. And that's so often not the case. And treating insomnia can often help with so many other issues as well. All right, a lot there, that makes sense. And Diane, in your case, using your specific example, you talked about the two different parts to your sleep challenge, the circadian rhythm, the dysfunction there, and the insomnia. How did you go about working through that? Did you like pick one of the areas and, and work on that first, or did you dive into both? How did that look? What was the first step out of that? So I kind of looked at it as, and this is, I, I think, a really helpful way Um because sometimes this can seem overwhelming. I just wrote a book full of sleep solutions and I don't want people to feel like they now have to read the whole book and try every single one of them because that can actually backfire on you. And so I think you have to find what for you is going to be the difference maker. And so it can, and that can often start by ruling out what you're not going to start with. And I love the question of what is different now from when I slept well. Um, 
to kind of start off that conversation with yourself. Because, for example, we will often hear about the evils of screens and blue light and how detrimental it is to our sleep. And so you have a ton of people who then banish all screens within two hours of sleep or three hours of sleep. In fact, there are many sleep articles that will tell you to do that. This can often backfire on insomniacs, though, because if chilling out and watching TV at the end of the day was how is how you unwind and take your mind off things, and now you remove TV from the equation, we will often fill that time with things that make us think and worry about our sleep, which is much more harmful to our sleep, arguably, than the, the amount of whatever amount of blue light we're getting from our TV. So rather than try to, you know, do what I did, rather than make all the mistakes I made and try all of the sleep tips that are out there, instead, try to look at what's different now than then. And what do you think is causing your sleep problems? So for example, if you say, well, what did I used to do before I had sleep problems? Before bed, let's say you're looking at your bedtime routine and you say, well, I used to just watch TV and go to sleep when I slept fine. Then TV wasn't the problem. So banishing TV from your nightly routine is probably not going to be your solution. So don't start there. If you always had that morning cup of coffee and there's no reason to believe that you've your caffeine tolerance has changed because you didn't, you know, you haven't started any new medications. There's nothing, you know, different along those lines. And, and the book will list several things that can alter your caffeine tolerance. But assuming there's no reason to believe your caffeine tolerance has been changed and you've always had that morning cup of coffee and you used to sleep fine, then coffee's probably not what's causing your sleep issues. So quitting caffeine, especially if that's something that's difficult for you, is probably not the best place for you to start. And so that question in and of itself can lead you down the right path. And then the other part of it is once you kind of become knowledgeable about some of these sleep disorders and some of the more effective solutions for them, then you can decide which of these seems like it's going to be most effective for me and which of these is really easy for me to implement. And so that I think is the guiding is the guiding force. And so for me as a night shift worker, I knew circadian rhythm was a huge part of my issue and light and dark are the most powerful tools to control your circadian rhythm. And so for me, I started with exposing myself to bright light when I was waking up at 5 p.m., 6 p.m., 7 p.m., um, and trying to limit my light intake toward the end of my shift. And so when I leave one studio to go to another, because we do, we shoot Good Morning America at a different studio than we shoot World News Now. So I would have to leave one studio and go to another across town. So now I'm exposed to all this bright sunlight right before I'm supposed to go to sleep. But my body sees that bright sunlight and says, oh, it's morning, it's time to be awake. So no wonder I was having trouble sleeping. And so it's something as simple as wearing sunglasses when I left at the end of the day and lowering the lights in my office toward the end of the day, um, lowering the shades in my apartment before I came home so that when I came home, I came home to a relatively dark home. All of these things were really, really easy for me to implement and they made a huge difference for me. And then I also knew that that sort of anxiety response of, oh God, am I going to fall asleep? Am I going to be awake? I'm not going to be able to function tomorrow. That kind of overactive mind, that insomnia response, I knew that that was another huge issue for me. And so a great tool that I found was something called constructive worry. And I call this a brain dump or a worry list. Essentially, you just take a notebook, you divide a page down the center, and on the left-hand side, you write down anything that's on your mind. It could be like a to-do list format or just something that's hanging over your head. I'm afraid I'm going to get COVID. And then on the right-hand side, you write down the very next step to resolving that issue. It doesn't have to be the ultimate solution, but it could be calling a friend who knows more about that issue than you do, or taking some small precaution that will make you feel more secure. Um, you know, if you're worried about getting COVID, maybe the to-do list will be to get vaccinated or to do something else that will help further your protection. And if it's something that's completely out of your hands, accept and move on. Write that down too. And mind you, when I read about this, I was thinking, well, Ambien doesn't put me to sleep anymore, but this notebook thing is going to. Uh, but it works really um, well for a lot of people. And, and here's why. One, so many of us are go, go, go all day long that we don't really give our brains the opportunity to process our thoughts and feelings of the day, which is a completely normal thing to do. And so for many of us, our brains go into this sort of overdrive, overthinking mode when our head hits the pillow, because it's the first opportunity we've given our brain to think about these things. It's the first time we're not staring at our phone or having a conversation with someone. And so by doing the exercise ahead of time and processing our thoughts and feelings ahead of time before bed, you alleviate the need to do it in bed. If you start doing this enough, 
your mental autopilot kicks in again and forms a new association that, oh, this is where we think and worry about things, not when my head hits the pillow. Um, and a lot of the reason we get repetitive thoughts when we go to bed is our brain just trying to remind us to deal with that thing. The same way you would remember a phone number you couldn't write down by repeating it to yourself over and over again, it's our brain doing that same thing. And so by writing these things down, our brain gets the memo that, okay, I don't need to remember, re keep reminding her to do this because it's written down on the page. And then finally, the exercise itself kind of gets you focused on solutions rather than just ruminating on problems, which so many of us do when we're in this insomnia cycle. Yeah, and let's talk I a bit more about that because the insomnia, you talked about this in the book and I found it really interesting where a lot of times I know this happens for me, you know, you wake up in the middle of the night for whatever reason, it can be to use the washroom or it doesn't matter, but you start thinking about something that, you know, in the morning seems so silly, but you get caught up in that cycle in the middle of the night and you, you have, there's actually science behind that. Your brain works differently at that time. And knowing this can be helpful when that thought comes up, like, am I really being rational here? Yes. And I love this because it doesn't come up in interviews very often, but it was a big aha moment um, for me. And this is more of a leading theory um, rather than something that's been proven through clinical research, which I'm not sure you can ever prove it. Um, but it is a, lead a leading theory from researchers and clinicians. And it is that um, your there are parts of your brain that sort of power down during sleep. And that includes the parts of your brain that manage things like rational thinking. And so when we find ourselves awake in the middle of the night at a time when we are usually sleeping or supposed to be sleeping, we might be awake, but that part of our brain that controls rational thought is essentially still asleep. So you don't have that ability at night, that normal filter that you have during the day to discern between something that really is catastrophic versus something that's not a big deal. And so it becomes so much easier to spin out. And I use the, you know, the example of a freckle in the book where, you know, if you found a freckle during the day, you might say, oh, okay, I should, I'll make an appointment to get that checked out with the dermatologist. But then if you wake up at 3 a.m. and you start thinking about that freckle, you might suddenly be planning your funeral, even though there's no evidence that there's anything wrong other than the fact that you just have a freckle. And that can happen with lots of other things. And so, this is kind of another reason why I found constructive worry and even just straight journaling where you just put pen to paper and let your con stream of consciousness flow onto the page. Because the next morning, when I go back and read back those journals from two you know, or three o'clock in the morning, I realize how, how much worse this situation felt to me then than it does in the light of day. And you realize, oh, God, I really blew that out of proportion in my head, didn't I? And I think knowing the mechanisms behind why it's happening can also be helpful. Where now, if it does happen, you may still be prone to this kind of catastrophizing. But at least now you know what's happening and you can identify it and say, you know what? The last time I was worrying like this at 3 a.m., it really wasn't that bad or it wasn't bad at all. And so that can kind of, I think, help take the temperature down on those thoughts and worries, help you kind of calm yourself down, talk yourself off the ledge and say, you know what, this probably isn't so bad. It's just because my brain is doing that thing where it makes things seem a lot worse than they are. And so I can calm down. And that, that can, in the end, help you calm down and hopefully enough that you can then get back to sleep. You shared that story when you're waking up in the evening and you'd go to work overnight and you got into different light changes you made. I think you said you had some kind of lighting protocol when you woke up at that time to, you know, get yourself going and you had certain shades that you had down when you'd come home and you'd wear glasses if you needed to during the middle of the day. Well, middle of your day. I'm curious, how how effective are those light boxes? Is this something you still use? What schedule are you on now? And is that something you still use? I work and, and is it something you recommend for people? Yes. Um, short version, yes. If you're someone who struggles to wake up in the morning, um, and someone who struggles to fall asleep at night, uh, it can be a huge help if circadian rhythm is part of the issue. And one of the ways that can help uh, indicate that is if you can sleep better, let's say on the weekends when you can do it later, when you can go to bed later and you can wake up later, you sleep fine. But then during the week when you have to wake up for work, you have a hard time. That's an indication that it's probably your circadian rhythm that's keeping you awake and not sort of your textbook anxiety insomnia. Um, and so particularly for that crowd, this um, can be really helpful for some. 
And you will often hear things like expose yourself to bright sunlight in the morning for 30 minutes. But especially if you're someone who has trouble waking up in the morning, you probably don't have an extra 30 minutes in your morning routine to be able to sunbathe. Same for, you know, right now it's New York, it's January, it's freezing over here. I'm not hanging out outside for 30 minutes in the morning. Um, and I don't have that time either. I'm, ju I'm juggling and getting two kids ready and whatnot and then getting myself out the door. And so a way that I found to get around this, um, and for shift workers, because many of us are waking up when the sun actually isn't out. So this for me was a great kind of hack to get around that recommendation. And it was to put a therapy light in my bathroom. It takes no work at all whatsoever for me to just switch it on. And it's the size of like a, a Kindle, like an e-reader. That just shines light. So it's not some big contraption. It's not expensive. They're super affordable. You can buy them just about anywhere. And I just put one in my bathroom. And now I turn it on when I am get ready in the morning, doing my makeup, brushing my teeth, washing my face, hair and makeup. For the men, it might be if you're shaving. Um, and so it takes no extra time out of your day. But now you're getting that powerful light signal that is telling your body it's morning. It's time to be awake. And that now gives your body clock something to set to, to say, oh, this is morning time. This is when I'm supposed to be sending them wake signals. And that not only helps you get wake signals at the right time of day when you want to be getting them, it also then helps you to get sleep signals at the right time at night when you're then trying to go to sleep. Okay, that makes sense. So you're basically letting your body know it's morning, putting that light on. But for somebody who is working, say, a night shift, you talked about the circadian rhythm before and that being one of the two issues you had with your sleep. How much impact do we have on switching that? Because obviously in your case, you know, you're you're putting that on in the evening and, and you're following a different circadian rhythm than a lot of people, like the classical nine to five worker will say. So how do how much can we influence and change that over time? It's debatable. Some people will say you can never fully do it. Other people will say the opposite. Um, there are some studies cited in the book to show pretty good success with all of the techniques that I detail in the book. So this isn't just, oh, here's what worked for me. This is, uh, you know, th these methods have been shown to really help. Um, when, when researchers go ahead and look at the specifics of when people are getting their melatonin onset. Um, but for me, it was super effective and it was just obvious and how much more easily I was sleeping and, and how everything else started falling into place. I didn't feel all jet laggy all the time anymore. But there are a number of things that are that can help program your body clock. And so I think for people who are shift workers, what I've found is the only solution that worked for me because I also worked weekends and had a different schedule on the weekends was to fully commit to this nocturnal lifestyle. And you can never shift your circadian rhythm to want to send you wake signals and sleep signals at a different time. But what you're really doing is you're tricking your body into thinking it's a different time of day. So, you know, the ideal way to deal with a circadian rhythm disorder is to change your schedule to suit your circadian rhythm. But for most of us, that's not an option. So the next best option is to trick your body into thinking you change your schedule. And light and dark are the most powerful tools to do that. So getting bright light in the, in the morning or getting bright light when you wake up, whatever time of day that may be, and making sure you're exposed to as much darkness as possible in the four to five hours before you go to sleep. This helps your body think that it's nighttime and think that it's morning time, even if it's really not. And then also things like what time you eat, what time you work out. Um, you know, for me, when I was struggling, as is often the case for people, I started craving a lot of food because that's one of the things that happens when you are sleep deprived. And it also, I think, becomes a comfort mechanism. And my body was naturally, like most people's, prone to eat during the day. And so when I found myself awake four hours after I had tried to go to sleep, well, of course my body wanted to eat again. That was when I normally would be eating lunch. Um, but it just made common sense that my body was not programmed to be eating and sleeping at the same time. So if I'm not going to sit down and have a full meal and then expect to go back to bed, that's not going to help my circadian rhythm and train. So I think for the people that I interviewed who do well on odd schedules, they all had the same thing in common. Consistency was number one. And number two was they kind of viewed their days entirely shifted. So 
one example was my old co-anchor, Andrew Grimes, who works for CBS um, New York. And she was, uh, she's, you know, she wakes up at one thirty or two o'clock in the morning, depending on the day to do her job. And she would say, you know, I would wake up in the morning and I would view kind of whatever I ate at, you know, 5 a.m. That was breakfast. And then lunch was around nine. And then dinner was at 3 p.m. when I got home. And and that was how, you know, she structured her day. Um, my producer, Janine Elliott, who worked on ABC News Now, uh, World News Now with me, the overnight shift, she would say, you know, for me, when I woke up at 10 p.m., that was breakfast. I viewed it like I was eating at 10 a.m. And then when I was eating at, you know, 3 a.m., I viewed that as lunch, as if I was just eating a late lunch at 3 p.m. And then when I was eating my, you know, whatever she ate, you know, in the morning hours for her was her dinner. And she sort of just shifted her whole clock mentally by 12 hours and then lived her life accordingly. And if you looked at her schedule, if you shifted everything by 12 hours, it made perfect sense. It's like what most people do, right? They wake up, they eat breakfast, then they go to work, they have lunch, then they come home, they have dinner, they work out somewhere in the middle there, right? But maybe right before dinner and then they go to bed. And so this was something that I had never done. I just sort of ate when I felt like it. I slept when it was available to me. I didn't have any kind of rhyme or reason to it. And once I got myself on a schedule and then started using these tools, light and dark and and looking at things like when I ate as a cue to my body for what time it is, uh, it made a huge, huge difference in my quality of sleep and then my health and well-being in general. And for somebody who is working odd hours, over time, will that cortisol that normally spikes in the morning Will that happen in the evening if that's when they're waking up? And will the melatonin kick in in the morning for them when it would normally kick in at nighttime for the rest of us? Yes. And the the interesting part about this is that there's something else called a compromised circadian position, which is when you kind of split the difference. Because a lot of people who work overnight shifts, they want to keep more normal hours on the weekends. But that gives you huge what's called social jet lag. Meaning, you know, you're jet lagged because your hours on weekends and the weekdays are different. And so Monday rolls around and it's it's as if you just traveled to another country. Um, if people use these tools, but instead of, and, and and this is because there is a specific, there are guides in the book for exactly what time to do these things. And it's all targeted to your target wake time and your target bedtime. If If you calculate your target bedtime and target wake time and you split the difference between what they are during the week and on the weekend and you try to keep them at most three hours apart, you don't even have to do this perfectly consistently. And what what research has shown, some of the studies that I cite in the book showed is that some of these people who achieved what's called a compromised circadian position, which is they got their circadian rhythm based on what time their melatonin releases to be neither perfectly in sync with their overnight shift nor perfectly in sync with their weekend schedule, but somewhere in between, we're still able to reap the benefits of falling asleep and getting a good night's sleep on both the weekdays and the weekends, almost or comparable to the people who fully entrain their circadian rhythm to the overnight shift, which I found really interesting. And even the people who didn't nail it perfectly in the middle still were able to sleep dramatically, dramatically better than the control group who did not entrain their circadian rhythm or achieve this compromised circadian position. One thing I really like you did with the book is break down circadian rhythm and sleep drive right away. And I think an important point for people, and you've talked about sleep drive now and circadian rhythm, but is to get those in sync with each other. So sleep drive being, you know, how long we've been up and and you eventually, we could get into the science, the adenosine builds up over time and And no matter what, eventually you get to the point, you just have to pass out and and get some sleep. But timing that with the circadian rhythm, so they work together and not opposed, I think is key in in all this mix. Yeah. So ideally, right, we want to spend the full day awake. So our sleep drive is nice and high when we're getting ready to go to sleep. Our circadian rhythm, ideally, will have been nice and high all day too because it's daytime and we're primed to be awake. And then at nighttime, our circadian rhythm starts to take this big dive 
And so ideally, that's when you want to be going to sleep because your sleep drive at this point, if you've been awake all day, is nice and high. So that's going to make you feel sleepy. And now your circadian rhythm is starting to take a dive. So as you are sleeping and your sleep drive is starting to dissipate, you stay asleep because your circadian rhythm is keeping you asleep. And then as morning time comes, your circadian rhythm starts to rise. Suddenly you wake up and because you got that full night's sleep, your sleep drive has dissipated too. So you feel awake and ready to go because you have no sleep drive left. And also your circadian rhythm is now rising and making you feel awake. So that's how it works when it's all working in sync and properly. But of course, for most of us, or at least many of us, it's not working perfectly. And so we do want to try to align those as best as we can. And another, that's why another kind of big part of fixing sleep problems can also can involve tweaking your sleep schedule. And sometimes it means staying up later than you think you should, at least in the onset, or waking up earlier than you think you should, at least in the onset, and spending less time in bed overall so that you can boost your sleep drive and get to a point where you fall asleep quickly and stay asleep, you're sleeping efficiently, and then you can start to expand your time in bed again. But a lot of people are surprised to hear that, that when they go and get treated for insomnia, they will often be given instructions to only spend, let's say, six hours in bed. And they'll say, wait, what? I thought you were supposed to help me get more sleep. Uh, and the answer is yes, we build to that. But spending time awake in bed, time in bed doesn't always equal time to sleep. So we know sleep drive, the only way that you can impact that is actually getting sleep. Ways that we can affect that are, you know, wake up time, bedtime, and having a nap. You quickly touched on napping earlier. I'm curious for somebody who, you know, is having trouble falling asleep or staying asleep and they're suffering during the day and they're using a nap as a remedy to, you know, say midday, pick up some energy and and feel better for the second half of the day. Now that we know that's going to affect our sleep drive at night, what are your thoughts on napping? I think it depends on on the person and all of this advice, you know, is all kind of general. And so I, you know, I want to make clear that if people have specific issues that they want to, you know, kind of fine tune and address, there is professional help available and don't use a book or a podcast as a substitute for professional help. Um, but generally speaking, I think naps are fine if they don't affect your nightly sleep. And that's the general feedback I get when I ask clinicians about this. It's not like naps are evil. If you can nap, and then you still sleep fine at night, then go for it. And particularly if you if you nap as part of a daily schedule. If people, for example, who are shift workers, which we've talked about, can often will often sleep in two shifts because that's the way that makes most sense for them. And if you look at their circadian rhythm, often it's what makes most sense for their circadian rhythm too, which is kind of counterintuitive. Um, but if you're someone who has trouble falling asleep and has trouble staying asleep or has trouble waking up, um, has trouble with waking up before they actually want to wake up. They're waking up prematurely. For that group, if you're struggling already in that way, then most clinicians will tell you not to nap until you've addressed the problems. Because often napping in that case will just perpetuate the insomnia and it just makes it worse. And what you want to do in that situation is you want to lower your arousal levels, which is that that wake drive, the anxiety, the worries, the excitement, all that stuff that's make you, powering up your wake drive at night. You need to lower that so your wake drive comes down, but you also want to boost your sleep drive. And that ultimately is what helps you finally overcome and ultimately cure insomnia. But in order to do that, you have to boost your wake drive. And if you're napping every day, especially for long periods of time, that's not going to work. So if napping works for you and you still sleep well, go for it. If napping you find disrupts your nighttime sleep and is giving you sleep problems, then try cutting the nap out and see if that helps. Well, the other thing that's kind of on par with napping, the other thing people turn to is caffeine when they're tired midday. And you quickly touched on this before again, but I want to go a bit deeper into it. Let's talk about your thoughts on caffeine. You know, you talked about somebody that uses that as a regular thing. It might not be a good idea to cut that out of the routine if they're having trouble sleeping. Again, all this is, is very individual. But in a general sense, how often is caffeine an issue and what are your thoughts on it? I can only relay what the clinicians that I spoke to that I interviewed for this book told me, and they all had a very similar take, which is caffeine is almost never the problem. These are people who treat insomnia. Um, and so that seems to be the general feedback from clinicians. And the interesting part about caffeine when it comes to insomnia is, of course, yes, if you're drinking, you know, 
a double espresso at dinner and then wondering why you can't sleep, then yeah, maybe th- maybe start at the caffeine. Maybe take that out of your uh, routine and see if that helps. But if there's nothing obvious that jumps out at you, the stress of giving up caffeine for someone who really loves that morning cup of coffee can contribute to sleep problems, especially if it leads to you putting more pressure on yourself to sleep because you're thinking, oh God, well, I quit caffeine. I gave up that favorite thing of mine, so I better sleep tonight. That whole, anything that makes you think I better sleep tonight is probably going to backfire on you. So that's one. And two, as we, as we discussed, a lot of the initial part when you go and you're getting treated professionally for insomnia is to stay awake and build up that sleep drive. And so one of the calling cards, one of the, one of the main things that almost any sleep expert will tell you, if there's one thing to help your sleep, it's often waking up at the same time every day. And it doesn't have to be exactly the same time or super rigid, but generally speaking, that means even if you have a bad night, even if you feel like, oh, I only got five hours last night, you still wake up at the same time the next day. So that over time, your body sinks to that morning time every day, same wake up time. That helps your circadian rhythm to start giving you wake signals and sleep signals at the right time. But then also it means even after a bad night, If you wake up at the same time, when you try to go to bed the next night, now your sleep drive is extra high. And going to bed with a sleep drive that's extra high helps you fall asleep more quickly and sleep more deeply. And sort of your body will start to recover from that sleep loss, particularly if it's a short stint of sleep loss. So often the caffeine, if it will help you to stick to that schedule, to get your butt out of bed at the same time, even after a bad night, and not take that nap and not sleep in. Sometimes a small amount of caffeine that will help you stick to that schedule can be beneficial and can do more good than the harm that we think of caffeine doing to our sleep later on that night. When it comes to the amount of time somebody spends in bed before they fall asleep, you know, I'm sure there are a lot of people out there that are exhausted. They have a lot of sleep dead and they they hit the pillow and fall asleep right away and maybe think that's a good thing. Talk about time to fall asleep and and what would be a good range? I mean, this differs depending on who you talk to. The general, the general numbers I hear most often is somewhere in the realm of 15 to 20 minutes. But essentially, I think it's enough to not frustrate you. You know, if it takes you a half hour to fall asleep, but you're relaxed during that half hour, that's not really a problem. Uh, it's more if you were laying in bed frustrated and having that kind of where you're getting revved up and you're getting worried, that's where the problem um, lies. But on the flip side, you know, if you, if you're the kind of person who goes to bed and you're, you're out within a minute or two minutes or three minutes, that's not usually a good thing. That's a sign that you, you're probably sleep deprived and that's a sign to get checked. And I think a lot of us with sleeping problems or with insomnia, I should say, are envious of that person whose head hits the pillow and they're out like a light. Um, But the other interesting part of that is if you do struggle with insomnia, that period of time can often feel longer than it actually is because we're in such an elevated state that we are recording memories where often between the stage of being awake and between being asleep, we often lose memories in that stage. We don't remember what happened right before we fell asleep. We just know we went to bed, we laid, our thoughts wandered, and the next thing we knew, it's morning, right? When you're going through insomnia, because of that arousal response, that fight or flight response that's keeping you awake, it's also recording memories. You're hyper alert to everything that's going on. And so you will not only be awake longer sometimes, but you'll also remember so much more of that period of time between wakefulness and sleep, which can make it feel like it took you an hour to fall asleep when actually it took you half an hour or it took you 20 minutes. Um, And this is where things like recording yourself or and and a few other tips that I have in the book to test actually how long it takes you to fall asleep can be helpful because sometimes when we realize oh it actually isn't taking me that long that again can take the temperature down on all of those worries which actually calms down your wake drive and makes it easier to fall asleep again and again and again how do you feel about certain you know listening to certain podcasts or certain types of music or nature sounds or meditating before bed as as a tool so I like the podcast or audiobook or or you know whatever works for you. And they're kind of two different things, right? One, if you're talking about things like nature sounds or white noise, um those are what's called sound masking. And the objective of that is is not only to calm the mind, which it does um particularly nature sounds do have their own kind of 
calming attributes to them. But it also prevents noise disruptions from waking you up, or at least minimizes the chances of noise disruptions waking you up. Because it's not noise that wakes us up, it's changes in volume of things or changes in pitch. And so when you have sound masking, it means even if another sound happens, it's less likely to create enough of a change in volume since you already have the steady sounds coming through to wake you up. Um, music has been shown to have its own kind of sleep helping properties, where if you listen to the same music every day when you go to sleep, kind of habitually, and you do it, I, I forget what the amount of time was, but I want to say it's at least for three weeks. Um, it has been shown to help certain insomniacs either go from severe insomnia to mild insomnia or go from mild insomnia to no insomnia. Um, interesting fun fact there, it's not recommended for musicians because we listen to music in a very analytical way. And so that will trigger kind of your mind to go into work mode instead of relaxation mode. Um, but in terms of listening to meditations or podcasts, that kind of thing, that you're talking about something a little bit different now where you're looking to get your mind off of things, right? You're looking to get your mind off of those worries that are keeping you awake. Um, and I love a good podcast or audiobook to do this because it really works for me. And so, and I know a lot of people that it works for. So I think it's one of those things that if it works for you, great. And I also like an extra trick in there, which is if you set a sleep timer, which you should, so you're not listening to the thing all night, set a sleep timer and that can also be kind of a little hack to give you an idea of how long it's taking you to fall asleep because you can then go back in the podcast or audio book and see where you stop remembering the story. Cause often when we go back and we pick up and it's on chapter two, we start listening and we're thinking, wait, I have no idea what's going on. And then you realize somewhere in the middle of chapter one, you must've fallen asleep because the end clearly played on the podcast, but you weren't listening. So that can help you give you a, a better gauge of when you're actually falling asleep. So it has kind of that extra tool to it. But it also, for me, for example, if I read a stressful email before bed, which would be me wait, me breaking my own rules, which we all do, um, that will help me stop now thinking about the email and what I'm going to do to fix the problem because now I'm listening to the story that I'm enjoying in my book. And that helps me to drift off. Drift off. Meditation is a little bit of a different piece because that's I think a little bit more of an active participation right and for many people with insomnia meditation can quote unquote backfire not because there's anything wrong with meditation but often because of what's wrong with our expectations going into meditation and I did this 100% I felt like oh I can't sleep because I can't shut my brain off that's often what conditioned arousal feels like and what insomnia feels like and so now I hear that meditation is something that quiets the mind and so naturally, I keep my expectations super realistic. And I think, well, I'm going to download a meditation app tonight. I'm going to put it on. And I'm going to be like Neo from The Matrix, blocking my thoughts like slow motion bullets. And then I'm just going to be able to go to sleep in this sleep-filled zen, and my problem is going to be solved. And naturally, spoiler alert, it doesn't work that way, right? You start listening to the meditation, and then you start getting distracted. And the narrator's telling you to focus on the breath, and you find that you're busy thinking about how you forgot to get your bike repaired, and you really need to get that done. And then you kind of pull yourself back and you say, okay, idiot, stop. Focus on, he's telling you to focus on your knees, focus on your knees. And now you're, you're focused again for another five minutes and suddenly your mind starts to wander again off to whatever it is that's keeping you, um, that's, you know, that's holding your attention. And for many of us, because we are putting so much pressure of our, in our, on ourselves in that moment that I have to meditate well in order for the meditation to work so that I can sleep we now get so worried about the fact that we're not meditating well. And those worries make it harder for us to focus on the meditation, make us more frustrated. It all makes it harder for us to sleep. And now if you're like me, you're not only chastising yourself for being a bad sleeper, now you're chastising yourself for being a mad meditator too, which again, makes it all makes it harder for you to sleep. And so what I found interesting when I looked at this is um, Dr. Jason Ong, who is you know one of the kind of the lead researchers when it comes to mindfulness and sleep, and he both researches this and he also treats people as a clinician. He said, you know, Diane, I, I'm a huge advocate for meditation for sleep, but I tell all of my patients to their surprise, I want you to meditate to help your sleep, but I do not want you to do it at night. And they say, wait, what? And he says, yeah, no, I want you to meditate during the day. And, and part of the reason for that is 
is this, and I use this analogy. If you were playing the piano for the first time, you wouldn't do it in the middle of an arena full of an audience with a blindfold on your face, right? You're because you already don't know what you're doing. So you're not going to put yourself at the disadvantage of being blindfolded. And you're certainly not going to up the stakes and up the pressure on yourself by doing it in front of an audience. But when we meditate in order to sleep, we're often doing it for the first time. We have no idea what we're doing. And now we're doing it at the time when it's most difficult for us to do, because we're doing it at night before bed, at which for an insomniac is a very stressful time of day. And we're doing it when the stakes are super high, because we're thinking, I have to meditate because I have to fall asleep in the next 15 minutes. And so instead of doing that, if you want to use meditation as a tool in this way to kind of learn how to relax and, and stop being yanked around from your by your emotions so much, you want to start doing it during the day at a time where you're already kind of calm. Because now you can work on developing that skill at a time when it's easier for you to develop develop that skill. Like you have training wheels in a way. And again, that mental autopilot, that starts to kick in again. And your brain will start to recognize, let's say the when you turn on your meditation app or you light your candle or whatever it is that's part of your meditation ritual, your brain will start to recognize that as a cue for relaxation because it's happening at a time when you're already relaxed. And so as you go to do that and you develop this conditioned response and you develop the natural skill of meditation, now you can use it later on at a time when you're feeling particularly anxious to maybe calm yourself down. But you have to first develop the skill and it's best to do that, according to the experts, at a time when you're actually already kind of powered down and, and pretty relaxed instead of starting at a time you're really stressed. Are you somebody that has done this and meditates during the day or meditated during the day to build that skill? Or is that something no, that just doesn't work for you? I did not. Uh, it probably would have worked for me if I, if I did it, but we talked about in the beginning, you know, how do you choose what you're going to do? We all have to choose what sleep tools are going to fit best for us. And so for me, while I know that it works and I know that for a lot of people, it works wonders. I decided that for me, based on my lifestyle, my inability to kind of find a free moment every day at the same time or find a free moment during the day at all, um, you know, and kind of lots of other factors that have to do with me personally, I decided that that was not going to be the best approach for me. And so I found that for me, I did better using constructive worry, that worry list technique that we spoke about, because I felt like that was idiot proof. I didn't have to worry about doing it wrong because you really can't do it wrong. And even though I couldn't technically do it, you know, two hours before bed or three hours before bed, which is what's generally advised, I did it right before bed because that's when it was available to me. It still worked. And so I found after I started doing constructive worry and I started feeling a little bit more calm, I started sleeping better. Then I was able to use meditation as a, you know, as kind of a sleep tool or just a nice ritual at night before I went to bed because I was coming into it already in a much more relaxed state. And the simple knowledge of learning that you're supposed to be distracted when you're meditating, and that doesn't mean you're a bad meditator, which it took a meditation expert telling me that for me to finally realize that, that then also helped me because I was no longer getting mad at myself every time I get, got distracted. I realized that's kind of the whole point of meditation. It's not to never get distracted. It's to notice when you're getting distracted and pull your focus back. That is the exercise. That's what develops the skill. Um, but for me, that was not the starting point. I felt like I needed constructive worry as the starting point, but somebody else might decide that they do think that that would be a good tool for them. And so for them, they might choose to do this and do it during the day and develop that skill in the way that I described before. Got it. So not a tool you use in the beginning over time. Now it's something you've adopted. Yeah. And I don't, I actually don't, I have to confess, I don't use it anymore, but I did use it sort of somewhere in the middle of my journey when I was kind of on the road to recovery, but not, not completely there. I, I enjoyed meditating at night. Now I, I enjoy more periods of silence and I kind of like, kind of consider that my own form of meditation, if you will, but I don't use it as a sleep tool the way I used to. Got it. So earlier we talked about caffeine, using that as a stimulant to pick ourselves up. Let's go to the other end of the spectrum now and talk about alcohol. What would you say to somebody who swears by, you know, that drink I have every night before bed, helping me fall asleep, helping me get that sleep I need? What does the science show? <laughs> so this is so deceptive because 
alcohol is still kind of the old favorite. It is the number one sleep aid in the world, which is terrible because alcohol is actually horrible for our sleep. Um, and it's deceptive because alcohol does help us fall asleep. You know, if you drink enough of it, it'll make you pass out. But it's what happens after, you know, as the night goes on, everything that alcohol does to help you fall asleep easily, it all then goes haywire. It, it messes with your body temperature rhythms. It messes with your melatonin rhythms. It messes with lots of other things having to do with your circadian rhythm. Uh, and it also messes with your sleep drive. And so you may fall asleep more easily, but the second half of the night is a whole other story. And this may manifest as it does for me, where you actually fully wake up. Maybe your heart's racing and you feel hot and you feel dehydrated and, you know, and, and whatnot. Um, for some people, you may still be able to sleep through the night, but you don't realize that your sleep is a much lighter and in a much more disturbed state through that second part of the night. So even if you think you slept through the night, when you wake up in the morning, you're still going to feel terrible, not only because you're hungover, but also because you're sleep deprived. Um, and when we are under the influence of alcohol, that the threshold to disrupting our sleep is much lower. So a noise or temperature fluctuation, a light, you know, all the things that can disrupt our sleep on a normal day, maybe a noise that wouldn't disrupt your sleep on a normal night, now it will. You become just much more sensitive to any kind of sleep disruptions, which is another obstacle that you have to overcome if you're trying to go to bed after drinking. And unfortunately, there's no real easy way to get around this. Um, you know, I, I have several tips in the book to just kind of mitigate this as much as possible, because I think for a lot of people, you're going to go out every now and then and have a drink, regardless of whether or not it's bad for your sleep, me included. And so I like to know, well, how do I at least make it better? I know perfect is to not have the drink at all, but how do I at least make it better? So I do write a lot about that in the book and have several tips, but the only real solution is time. And so if you can give yourself more time between that last drink or drinks and when you go to bed and essentially give yourself enough time to sober up before you go to sleep, that's the best way to keep alcohol from having a negative impact on your sleep. Dan, a part of your book I really appreciated was the talk of how to black out a room because this is, you know, every to do list, you know, if you Google sleep help is going to have, you know, get blackout blinds. And you, you got into the nitty gritty there and you even talk about, you know, blocking out the light from under the door and blocking out the light from different uh, electronic devices in the room. So I'd love for you to take us through because I've, you know, lived in a lot of different areas and a lot of different, you know, homes and different bedrooms I've had. And there's always, you know, the cracks at the side or the crack at the bottom. Like it's so it's hard so to get annoying. the room blacked out. <laughs> so as somebody who has taken this all the way to the extreme... How does somebody properly black out the bedroom? All right. Well, mind you, one, I'm extremely light sensitive. My mother is too. So not everybody may have to go through these same lengths. Um, and I used to sleep during the day when I worked an overnight shift. But even now, I, I live in Manhattan. So I live in a very brightly lit city. So there's a lot of light coming through. And someone who lives in the country may not have to deal with any of this. Um, but I found for me, I do need a very dark room even still. Uh, and so just the normal, you know, get blackout curtains, that was not cutting it because there was so much light coming into the room from all these different areas. And so one, make sure that you're buying something that is 100% light blocking material because just the term blackout often is used to describe anything from something that's light diffusing to something that is actually 100% blackout. And there are a lot of different variations of that in between. And it's so disappointing when you're someone who really wants that dark cave-like room, when you hang up your blackout curtains that you're so excited and then you get home and you realize they're not really blackout. You can still see the light shining through. Um, and so one, you wanna make sure the material is really 100% um, light blocking. And then you want to find a solution where you're not going to get light bleeds around the middle, around the center, around the top, around the bottom. And that's much easier said than done. I found for me, the kind of the easiest solution when I was working the overnight shift was portable blackout blinds, which I didn't even know were a thing. And when I found them, I wanted to shout it from the rooftops. And there are several different you know, kinds and brands and whatnot. You can even make them on, on your own. But essentially, it's a piece of light, 100% light blocking material that connects to either the window frame or the glass itself with Velcro or suction cups. 
And because it's against the frame or against the glass itself, instead of being kind of around the perimeter of the window, the way curtains or, or blinds are, it gives you such a better seal against the light is the best way I can describe it. And if you have already any kind of curtain or shade, you can put it underneath them because it goes, again, directly on the window frame or directly on the light. And so for me, that was my solution on, on the overnight shift. Um, for those who either don't like the appearance of those and don't feel like taking it down and putting it back up every day because you can't just roll them up and roll them down like a normal um, blind, um, look for shades if you're going kind of the, the blind or shade realm. You want something that has channels on the side that blocks the light or you want to buy an additional product that will do that, which they sell. You can also get curtain panels that exist purely just to block that side. So you don't, if you don't feel like buying a full curtain, but you have a blackout shade, you can do that as well. And then sometimes just a little DIY action. If you get some Velcro, adhesive Velcro that doesn't damage the wall, um, you can stick that to the side of the curtain itself and stick the curtain to the wall. And that will help kind of seal that space between the side of the curtain and the wall. You can do the same with the middle of the curtains with either tape or again, attaching Velcro to the curtains. Now you can Velcro down the center to seal that side. And then, you know, for the top, it depends on the shape of your window, but some people find success just stuffing a light blanket um, on top of there or putting another piece of fabric or material up there. Um, but it is important if you're a light sensitive person, particularly, to really get that darkness because sometimes we underestimate how much light is affecting our sleep, but it can have, it has a dual impact. Light is immediately alerting. So when you see it, you immediately feel awake, but it also has a circadian alertness as well, where when you see light, that light is entering the eye and communicating to the brain that it's daytime and time to be awake. So if you are exposed to bright light while you're sleeping, it can disrupt your sleep in the moment, but it can also weaken those sleep signals that your circadian rhythm wants to be sending you and should be sending you at night. And sometimes we even feel like it's not really disrupting our sleep when research has shown that even for people who don't realize the light's disrupting their sleep, it can be. So there are a lot of benefits to a good dark room when you're sleeping at night if you struggle to fall asleep or stay asleep. And then a couple of your DIYs are taking electrical tape and using that to cover lights in the room. Mm -hmm. And I want you to talk about under the door because this is a great DIY that uh, I haven't heard before. Yeah, I felt like I was playing whack-a-mole, right? Because when I finally sealed the window, I felt all victorious. And then I looked around and realized that, you know, my cable box, my alarm clock, all these little electronics that I never took note of have these little lights that in the dark, there actually can be enough, enough light to be disturbing. So the electrical tape was a great hack for that. And they make it in lots of different colors, which I didn't know before. So you can usually find a shade of electric tape that matches whatever, you know, whatever electronic you're putting it on. So it's very subtle. Um, and then the door was the kind of the last stage for me where I hadn't even thought about it until I got all the other light out of the room and realized how much light was coming through my door. So I got weather stripping. It's just kind of foam um, that has adhesive on one side. And I just put it all the way around my door frame. And then I got a door sweep and I put it on the bottom of my door because I used to shove a towel there. That was kind of my, you know, my temporary solution. Um, and I had a door sweep on my door. And the great part about it was not only did this then seal out the light. So now it really made my room truly dark, but it also helped to soundproof the room. So now when you're sleeping during the day, especially, you know, in my case, but anytime, you're that much less likely to be woken up from some outside sound that otherwise would get through the door. Now it would help make your room a little quieter too. And the same can be true for all the blackout solutions on your window. Not only will it help make the room darker, but it can also help make the room a little quieter. And how did your husband feel about all these mods he did around the bedroom? He didn't care about anything except for the blackout blind. The portable blackout blind on the window finally just got to a point where I just never, I stopped just taking it down because it just got annoying to take it down and put it back up every single day. And we weren't home. We were almost never home at that time because he was working at the office all day. I was at the office all day, et cetera. Um, so we just kind of kept it up and he didn't like that part of it very much because on the weekends when we were home, you know, he wanted to see the sunshine coming through his bedroom window, but we were both too lazy to take it down and put it back up. So we just left it up. Um, that's not a factor anymore because I don't work the overnights anymore. So now we just have a normal blackout shade on our window and that, 
that does the job just fine for us sleeping at night. But that was really the only thing he got annoyed at because everything else was really, it was inconspicuous. You didn't even notice any of it. So there was nothing for him to get annoyed about. Well, as we wind down here, Diane, you mentioned you're not on the overnight anymore. So I'd love for you to take us through what time in the evening you start to wind down and what that protocol looks like. And again, I want to caveat this. This isn't follow exactly what Diane does, but this is, you know, a personal experience from somebody that has tried a lot of things, done a lot of research. And I think it can give people a lot of ideas for them to at least try on and and see if they work for them as well. My bedtime routine, it may surprise people. One, it differs you know, depending on the day, because my work schedule can differ dramatically from day to day. And there's not a whole lot in it that is sort of a specific sleep friendly thing. And, and I, and I say that on purpose, because I did go through a period of time when I was struggling, where I really tried to perfect my bedtime routine. And so I came home and I had no screens and I didn't eat anything because you're not supposed to eat before bed. As I explain in the book, that's not true for everybody. Um, I, you know, I had the lavender oil on the pillow and I would take the baths and I would do this and I would do that. And I, I was doing all of the quote unquote right things and having a terrible time sleeping. And what I've learned is a perfect bedtime routine for many sleep clinicians is actually a red flag for insomnia because it means you're thinking and worrying so much about your sleep and trying so hard to sleep that that is actually what's contributing to keeping you awake. Um, and so... For a bedtime routine, one of the things that I write about in the book, and this came to me from two clinicians, it's much easier if you just ask yourself two questions. You maybe start with, what did I do before I had sleep problems, right? If before you had sleep problems, this goes back to the beginning of of our conversation, you say, oh, well, I just used to, I don't know, watch TV and go to bed. Great. Go back to doing that. If you enjoy taking a bath before bed, and that's kind of a relaxing thing for you to do, great, do that. So question one, what did I do before I had sleep problems? Question two is just what seems like a nice way to end the last hour or half hour of your day and just do that. So those are kind of your two guidelines. And so for me, that means usually uh, I will come home. I will hang out with my family, take my son to the playground really quickly. If we can, I'll make dinner. We all have dinner together as a family. and then. We either all as a family will have a little bit of TV time where we, our son is obsessed with Disney. So we'll often have a little bit of Disney time with him. And then he goes off to bed and my husband and I will watch a quick show. Um, but if I, um, if I, while I was writing the book or if I'm on assignment for work and I have something that I have to do, any and all of that can get thrown out the window. I frequently will have to work late at night. So now I'm staring at a computer screen and typing. And when I was writing the book, interestingly enough, my writing time came after all of the things that I just described to you. So even though you should technically get the work done early and get the relaxation part toward the end of the day, that just didn't work for us. So I would have this quality family time and then I would retreat off into the bedroom, which for us is also an office. And I would, that's when I would get my writing done. And often when I'm working, I do the same. I will come in at the end of the night, almost right before I go to bed to catch up quickly on news to prepare for the show the next day, or if I'm working on a story to finalize my script, or if I'm writing a book to get a little bit more work done there. And even though it's not a perfect bedtime routine and I don't adhere to it perfectly, it suits me much better than when I did have a perfect bedtime routine. Um, and what what was interesting for me too is in the process of writing this chapter of the book and describing my bedtime routine i kind of thought of all of those things that i just described to you as my bedtime routine and then i realized it's probably more what i do right after that right i'm on the computer and i'm finishing up some work or whatnot my husband comes in he goes to bed i kiss him good night i go off i make myself a small sleep friendly snack, like a cup of oatmeal or something like that. I prepare that meal unbeknownst to me in silence. So I think that's part of my unwinding process where I think about the day and I kind of have my own little moment with myself. And then I get ready for bed. I brush my teeth. I wash my face. I do whatever else I'm going to do. And I get in bed. It's not elaborate by any means. But this is my ritual that happens every single night before I go to bed. And 
the fact that I didn't even realize that it was my bedtime routine, I think is actually great because I think when we talk about bedtime routines, the part that we often miss is for an insomniac, the best thing a bedtime routine can probably be is an afterthought because it means you're just not thinking that much about it. You're just trying going through and doing the things that make sense to you that you enjoy and then you fall asleep. And so often just taking our minds off of it, stepping back and chilling out about the whole thing and just doing the thing that's enjoyable to us rather than doing a bunch of things that we feel we should do in order to sleep, that actually helps our brain to get into unwind mode instead of putting it into work mode because we're trying to force ourselves to do all these sleep-friendly activities that maybe we don't enjoy. No, I think that's really important, especially as somebody who has struggled with their sleep and has done all this research it takes the pressure off because like anything else in the health and wellness space, you can continue to learn and pick up all these different nuggets and try and layer them on. And over time, it can just become stressful and and break what you're trying to build up. Exactly. I mean, when we pack our bedtime routines full of things that we think we should do in order to sleep instead of things that we enjoy, we're essentially putting our brain into work mode. And so, you know, we're nearing the end of the day and our brain's like, okay, it's time to chill out and unwind. And then all of a sudden we start doing all of this stuff that we are supposed to be doing. Our brain suddenly says, oh, okay, I thought we were relaxing, but now it's time to work. And that just revs you up and puts you in that active mental state that makes it harder to fall asleep. And it also increases the pressure on yourself because now you're laying in bed and you're thinking, well, I did all of this stuff. I better sleep. And that always backfires. And what I found interesting for myself, and I think this is pretty common, is we will often then take activities that in and of themselves are enjoyable. I love a good bath. And that is now a treat for me and is a way I unwind. You know, at least once a week, I'll take a nice long bath before bed. And I love it. Um, But when we're in that state of doing things because we're supposed to do them in order to sleep, often we're no longer enjoying the bath for its own value. We're not enjoying the way the water feels against our skin. We're sitting in the bath thinking, gosh, I really hope this helps me sleep tonight. And so we're, we're losing the relaxation value that's supposed to be a part of our bedtime routine. And so I really think that when it comes to bedtime routines, it's really just, you know, avoid, avoid things that are obviously stimulating to you. Bright light, caffeine, we all know the drill. If playing video games is stimulating to you, then don't do that. But that will differ from person to person, what is stimulating and what is relaxing in terms of habits. Um, But you want to avoid doing things that you don't enjoy and that you're doing just for the sake of you think it's going to help your sleep. Because if you get into that pattern, it's actually probably not. And Diane, on a typical night, what time do you try and have lights out and, and go to sleep? My bedtime now is usually around 11. Um, but I'm not rigid about that on purpose because I think it's important for people to go to bed when they feel sleepy. And so a lot of us, when we are struggling, we make the mistake of, I have to go to bed by X. And we already discussed, you know, how early bedtimes can backfire on us when we have insomnia, but even just being rigid about our bedtime in general can have the same effect because we can control when we go to bed, but we can't always control when we actually go to sleep. And time spent awake in bed makes insomnia worse. So instead of focusing on, I have to go to bed by X, it can often help to just take the pressure off bedtime in general and go to bed when you feel sleepy. Have a general time in mind of when you think is a a good time for you to go to bed, but you don't have to be strict about that at all. And in the beginning, it can be helpful to do the opposite and set what I call a reverse curfew, which is you actually say, I will not go to bed before X time. Because there's something in the Jedi mind trick of that, where now you're challenging yourself to stay awake instead of forcing yourself to go to sleep, that takes the pressure off and actually helps you go to sleep. And if you continue to wake up at the same time every day, it also ensures that your sleep drive is nice and high. So even if you had a bad night, your sleep drive will be high the next day and it makes it easier for you to fall asleep the next day and the next day and so on. Um, And so I think when it comes to sleep schedules, unless your problem is that you wake up too early... It's better to focus on keeping the same wake up time and let bedtime fall into place on its own because waking up is the part we can control. We can't control when we fall asleep. So Diana, wrapping up here, you have a really unique perspective. You're somebody that's worked the night shift. Now you're working the day shift. You've had these sleep challenges. You've been able to remedy them over time. Did you find going from the night shift to the day shift, did things improve just from that simple transition? 
I had a lot of people ask me how long it took me to readjust to daytime. And I think it was two days. Yeah. I, I equate it to, um, to like a rubber band when you stretch a rubber band, like you can stretch it and you can hold it there for a good long time. But the moment you let go, the rubber band's going to go back to its original shape. And that's how it felt like for me with my circadian rhythm. I did a really good job of entraining my circadian rhythm to these very odd hours and did get to a point where I was sleeping, you know, a full night's sleep. For me, what's a full night's sleep? Um, and my health improved. All my, you know, symptoms, like I said, my acid reflux, my dry eyes, and the other kind of brain fog and other things that I was experiencing, all of that went away. Uh, but I did, I did find it interesting that the moment my sleep schedule changed and I went back to sleeping at night and waking up during the day, it was a very short period of time before my body just snapped right back into that schedule. And now I kind of have to move it in the opposite direction, right? Where because I am a biological night owl, I don't have crazy hours, but I still am waking up earlier than my body would naturally want to when left to its own devices. So I will still use bright light in my bathroom when I'm getting ready just to give my body that extra, hey, it's morning, it's wake up time to make sure I'm getting those wake signals at the right time. And I don't go crazy avoiding light at night because the more light we get during the day, the less we have to worry about light at night, which is how you can, I can do things like work on my computer at night and not panic that, oh no, this is going to ruin my sleep. It's not because I got enough night, light during the day. Um, so I will still take those, those kinds of measures. Um, and I will keep a, a roughly consistent schedule. So even on the weekends, I'll still usually wake up by seven at the latest on my own without an alarm clock. And that's the sign that it's working, right? Because it's not, I'm not dragging myself out of bed and, and you know, in the morning, especially on the weekends, I'm waking up on my own, which means now my body's getting enough sleep throughout the night and my circadian rhythm is giving me wake signals at the right time. And that may be the one area where kids can actually help your sleep because my kids will not let me sleep past seven regardless, even if I wanted to. Um, and so that consistency builds over time. And now my body naturally is waking up and falling asleep at the right times without any issues, even though left to its own devices biologically, I would naturally slide later. Well, Dan, thank you so much for sharing so much on the show today. And I'm just so happy for you. You've had this long journey with sleep and you've come to such a good place. And now you're here to share with everybody and, and help us all out. So thank you. And other than listeners getting a copy of your book, The Sleep Fix, how can they connect with you after the show? So I am on social media, um, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Diane R. Macedo. Uh, that's M-A-C-E-D-O. And um, I'm on, I just joined TikTok. And I am the Diane Macedo on TikTok because somebody else stole my name and is pretending to be me on TikTok. So uh, that's the only one where I'm not Diane R. Macedo. I'm the Diane Macedo on TikTok. Um, and then information on the book is at sleepfixbook.com. And if um, people tune into ABC,